calling government to account where there's been uh, breaches and, and where there's been fraud and irregular expenditure and so on. Um, and they have they were very vocal when it comes to holding government to account, and rightfully so, rightfully so. But when I raised the issue of Steinhoff on this particular Uncle, business, when it comes form, to holding everybody government went to quiet, and rightfully so, rightfully um, so. And when I, I raised the issue of Steinhoff I realized, on this particular business, when it comes form. to perhaps in the in the private sector, there there needs to be. Um, proper legislation which prevents the public from being uh, harmed uh, through what your delinquent directors, even within uh, the private sector, uh, do. So having said that, I think it's going to be a fine balance between ensuring and the, the challenge of unemployment, I do not think it's it's business's fault. Um, unemployment and the the uh, challenges of of inequality is not necessarily just the private sector's fault. Um, and I think more so, I think government needs to look a little bit closely at at uh, some of the um, structural changes that need to take place within government in order to. Uh, address the challenges of inequality in South Africa. And so I'm couching my words very carefully because while to some extent I would agree that we need to look at legislation which prevents excess um, at a business level, but at the same time what we do not want to do is to discourage and, and put disincentives uh, for for some key individuals uh, to keep businesses uh, going in in the country. Um, so yes, I, I think also looking forward to uh, further debate and and discussions on on the two bills. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honourable Tring, Honourable Chris Malamecha. Thank you, Chair. Morning, colleagues. Let me take this opportunity to welcome the presentation. Very straightforward. I think it helps to deal with a number of some ill social challenges, including the high employment rates. One way or another, if people can have a way of being able to can come up with their own initiatives that can assist without somebody and various. I think we are moving towards the right direction. It's a matter of us coming together and acknowledge that all these challenges are not for an individual, or for certain people, for all of us. And we reduce politics when we deal with them because high employment rate, high unemployment rate is for South Africa. It's not for certain race somewhere. It's for all of us. And all of us, we must contribute with our initiatives that we think can assist the minister and your team here and whoever was part here i think this presentation is very clear and is doing its best and dealing with the damage that was caused by those who were benefiting when others were suffering you will understand it's not going to be an easy thing minister it is just this question need to be asked how will this there is nobleness of the remuneration be determined or assessed in terms of the act. Then the second one was remedies that the act provide under circumstances where there is no correlation between the reasonableness of the remuneration of the senior executives and the lowest paid employees. When you go further, Minister, Slide 19, the information note indicates that the public companies will need to submit remuneration report to the, I mean, to be approved by the board as per section, as per section 38A, if you check there. What will be the effect on a private companies? I, I think we are in one country where we'll have the public and the private companies now 
that that the A latter speaker was attempting to come there, I said, let me come direct that way. Minister lies slide 15 on the disclosure of beneficial interest governed by the Amendment 26. There's an indication that some companies will be excluded. Which type of companies are these and what is the reason for their exclusion? Thank you so much, Comrade Chair. Thank you, Honorable Malamecha. Honorable Monakedi. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. I also want to add my words to those who have welcomed the presentation by the minister. I think it's uh, indeed quite tenuous and uh, it uh, dovetails uh, nicely with uh, what already has been uh, the measures the minister has taken to make sure that um, we respond uh, accordingly to the challenges of uh, gray this thing. My first question for clarity is uh, with regard to slide 18. In terms of amendment or amendments rather to section 30A, there is a, a new statutory requirement for public companies and state-owned companies to produce the remuneration policy for directors and prescribed officers for approval. What consequences does the act or the bill put in place for failure to obtain required approvals? My next question, uh, Chair, is in as much as the act aims to address issues of income gaps and inequality, how will the reporting of this income gap assist in reducing inequality? How will it redirect or direct private companies to address the huge pay gap? This question is pertinent given the fact that South Africa is reported to be the most unequal society. So if uh, one can get some uh, clarities, some responses to those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Manakedi. Uh, Minister, uh, let me just check. I have some few clarity seeking questions as well. I wanted to check, uh, do the state-owned companies prepare their own remuneration policy? or they are prepared by National Treasury. Secondly, what will be the consequences for companies that do not disclose their remuneration policy? Uh, how will the reasonableness of remuneration be determined or assessed in terms of the Act? And the last one, what remedies does the Act provide under circumstances when there's no correlation between reasonableness of remuneration of senior executives and the lowest paid employees. Thank you very much. Over to you, Minister and the team. Well, first, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, also to, to each of the members who've asked questions. I think the questions uh, that members that uh, uh, honourable members have asked are, are questions that cut to the heart of some of the issues we've been deliberating on, thinking through, trying to find uh, the appropriate balance. So, if I start with um, uh, honourable McPherson's um, uh, remarks and comments, um, first, thank you for the the comments, uh, honourable McPherson. I think that the the, uh, the 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 matter of ease of doing business <clears throat> is one of the things that we want to advance, and obviously, in a package of measures as the bill represents, there will be a number of areas where, self evidently, it will make the ease of doing business. Uh, it will improve it. In other areas where there's a necessary uh, public objective. We hope that the bill has been crafted in such a way that it removes any unnecessary administrative or red tape requirements, that it keeps it 
focused only on the specific objectives and that it does so efficiently. And, and I hope when Parliament looks at it, uh, it would be able to make um, that judgment on, on the matter. Yeah. So on the, the broader question that uh, Honourable McPherson asked, which is, does the bill make it more onerous and cost companies more? I think the bill does require some new provisions. They, in areas of uh, disclosure of the true owner of a company, um, and they are uh, in the area of the um, the remuneration and uh, uh, and and those without any question are uh, 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 new. Now, on the question of the true ownership. The bulk of that has already been incorporated in the company. So these are very small tweaks and refinements to what has been approved through the General Laws Amendment Act. I think Honorable McPherson asks very interesting questions um, on um, the, the matter of the, uh, the equity issues in the bill. <clears throat> and <clears throat> they, they picked up uh, by Honourable Mulder, Honourable Tring, uh, Honourable Malimetsa, and Honourable Monakedi. So I'm going to try to deal with all of them, and I hope I do justice to each of the questions that have been asked. So Honourable McPherson's uh, first question is, what has been the response of business? And in the NEDLAC process, because... The, the whole discussion around pay equity and uh, disclosure became a, a significant conversation between parties in NEDLAC. I was uh, quite struck by the high level of convergence of thinking between the business uh, representatives in uh, NEDLAC and the labor representatives on a number of areas. On the substance, I would say there was considerable uh, convergence of thinking. There were areas where the labor movement wanted to go further than what is in the bill, uh, or the business community wanted uh, a more constrained um, approach that's, uh, than in the bill. But broadly speaking, it was striking the degree of consensus on the, the basic thrust of, uh, of what is in the bill with these particular and specific reservations. Honorable McPherson then raises the question around the, uh, the impact on businesses uh, potentially having uh, an incentive to, to a hide remuneration, uh, to uh, not acquire high-performing talent, uh, whether we're making rewards, whether we're giving it a pejorative tone by it being seem, uh, made to seem evil, and whether we incentivize employment outside South Africa. And Honorable Mulder picked up on the adverse effect on skills in particular and on, on enterprise more generally. So let me, let me deal with those matters by by a broader framing of the problem before coming to the specifics. And the broader framing is what are the options in society when, uh, when there is a significant public concern about the matter? We could take the view that this is not an appropriate matter for legislation and leave it be and um, uh, seek to have it addressed in other ways by other players in society, maybe uh, shareholders in the decisions they make about boards. There are uh, there are countries that have not done anything about it in their uh, legal framework. But when it becomes as pressing an issue and the level of public outrage is as high as it is, uh, then the public rightly expect that Parliament and the executive would take some appropriate steps. The question then is, what are those steps? And there's a range of steps that can be taken in um, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, the statutory treatment of uh, income gaps in a company. 
So at one end of the, the spectrum, one can require disclosure. And that is make the information available and uh, avoid lack of transparency on it. Moving further on the spectrum, uh, the legislature may decide it wants to guide companies and say um, the guidance is that you should not uh, have a gap above uh, this ratio. Going even further, Parliament could, a Parliament could at least in theory, decide to prescribe to say uh, thou shalt not. Now, I've given those three as examples of the kind of interventions that are possible. We felt that trying to prescribe the ratio between <clears throat> earners in a company is inappropriate, that markets are dynamic, that um, uh, companies, each company's skills mix may be very different. The um, requirements of specialist uh, skills could vary between companies. And when the, the um, executive or the legislature seeks to impose a rigid arrangement on companies, it could have a number of very adverse uh, consequences in the market, some of which members of parliament have pointed to. We gave some thought to whether there should be broad guidance, a normative uh, standard, which whilst not um, prescriptive, could assist companies. And it was felt that, having reflected on it, that it's not appropriate to do that. Uh, we, uh, while it would not be prescriptive on, on, on companies, by uh, the first challenge one would have is trying to identify what is that norm. And that itself would be quite significant uh, uh, an exercise because it will vary greatly between, let's say, a, um, a, a high-risk small startup business where an entrepreneur is also the, um, the, um, uh, the, the only person with a particular skill set and knowledge from a typical standard uh, mass production uh, enterprise. It will vary between one sector of the economy and the other sector of the economy. And if one tried to do an, um, a, a single guideline like that, it's unlikely to offer enough guidance to boards and, and others uh, to be meaningful because of these wide range of factors uh, that vary across the economy. And so we, we decided on what is uh, the softest of the, the measures, but nonetheless, particularly helpful, and that is to require companies to disclose and to require shareholders to approve. And that's where the discussion has been. It's a disclosure that then empowers shareholders to say, well, now we've got full knowledge about the remuneration policy of the company and how it plays itself out on things like differentials we can now exercise our power as shareholders. So that's the approach we've taken. It was not without its debates. There was a strong argument made and labor, uh, organized labor favored this, that the uh, threshold should be 75%. In other words, for a remuneration policy to be approved requires the support of a supermajority of shareholders. 75%. So even if 25% uh, of shareholders are unhappy with it, then the remuneration policy should not proceed. And the 75% the and 25% are not just arbitrary numbers. There are some um, uh, jurisdictions, there are places in the world where, in fact, there is a supermajority uh, that is, um, uh, is applicable. But having regard to the fact that this is um, a significant innovation to uh, provide the kind of information that's required. Uh, we felt that an appropriate balance would be to leave it to a simple majority, to say 50% plus one of shareholders need to approve a remuneration policy. 
the fact that that remuneration policy comes up at an AGM, we hope will act as an important discipline for a board that it needs to look at many factors, skills needs, uh, pay differentials elsewhere in the same sector, uh, global markets, because South Africa operates in a global market in a number of particular uh, instances where businesses and talent pools are exposed to, to, um, to global markets. But then they will also take into account societal concerns and they will find a fair way of balancing these various matters because they know that there will be scrutiny by shareholders when the report is tabled uh, at an annual general meeting. That for us was an important step forward. And um, uh, in, and, uh, and so we, we settled on that. So I, I, I raise that, Honorable McPherson, because in a way, if one thinks of these three things, disclosure with shareholder uh, power, versus guidelines that are developed by the state versus prescription in law, we've taken the one that we believe is will have um, uh, a positive effect on uh, the discussion uh, on pay differentials without um, tilting the balance to the point where there's an enormous cost associated with the gain. So coming then to the specific question, will disclosure um, uh, result in businesses potentially hiding um, remuneration uh, or finding ways of remunerating that is not your box standard? Now, generally speaking, the guidance in South Africa around remun remuneration is uh, fairly strong and robust. So if uh, a, a company director was to um, get uh, free use of a, um, a company uh, jet, as an example, or holiday home, then that has to be disclosed. So the law has anticipated already uh, the potential for hiding of remuneration, and it has uh, tried to... Um, to address that. Of course, even with the current law, uh, arguably, uh, there are ways in which companies uh, hide uh, these things. It is possible. But that's the job of an auditor. And that's why it's so important to have independent auditors, because they can ask the probing questions around the flow of money, but also the utilization of assets. And um, so while um, uh, these challenges already arise from our current um, arrangement and, and will certainly be something that um, uh, one needs to take into account, uh, we do believe that the solution to that lies in effective audits and um, uh, very importantly, uh, proper standards. And globally, I think uh, the accounting profession has developed standards to uh, to ensure that remuneration in whatever form shape uh, cash kind is is appropriately um, uh, uh, disclosed now, honorable McPherson raises a second point which is also quite an important one which is will the the publication of the gap uh, or of the level of remuneration, disincentivize the acquisition of high-performance talent. And it's important for us <clears throat> that as Parliament thinks through this, <clears throat> that Parliament considers that question. Have we, have we secured a formulation that finds an appropriate balance between the different considerations? Where a company has high-performing talent, the bill does not in any way prescribe what should be the pay that goes with that talent. But it does place an onus on a, a company board to explain to shareholders why, in fact, <clears throat> the CEO or the COO or the IT specialist, uh, 
chief um, IT officer is earning what they are earning. And so it provides a necessary discipline that if earnings are higher than one would normally expect, that there is a um, uh, an, an, um, an explanation, a rationale that these are decisions that are taken based on uh, rational decision-making and a weighing of the evidence before a board. And that is what a shareholder is entitled to then uh, in an AGM, to ask those questions. And when the replies are not um, uh, acceptable to shareholders, shareholders then have the power to decline the remuneration report. So this does not constrain and put a cap on payments to a high-performing talent, but it does, we hope, bring in a more rational basis for ensuring that pay is for high-performance talent as opposed to a clubby atmosphere in <clears throat> a board that results in payments that shareholders would not want to approve. The next area is <clears throat> on whether the publication of pay differentials will make the uh, incentives for talented individuals seem as if it's um, uh, evil. That was the, the, the phrase, I think, that Honorable McPherson raised. And I want to suggest, similar to my, my, my response to the previous uh, uh, part of the question, boards of companies now have an opportunity <clears throat> and, in a way, an implicit obligation. Excuse me. <clears throat> in a way, an implicit obligation to rationally <clears throat> to rationally engage. If someone is, is really very, very good and is irreplaceable and has an extraordinary skill, the board is entitled to tell the shareholders that, to say, you know, we've got this absolutely exceptional talent. It's in a, a part of the market where uh, salaries and remuneration generally have been um, uh, very, very high. We've had to compete with other companies in this talent pool. And so it reinforces my point of bringing some degree of rationality to, um, to incomes. We've seen so many examples that the media has uh, commented on where companies have performed poorly, but CEO remuneration has performed exceptionally well. And um, in those kind of examples where there is no correlation between the value that an individual brings to a firm and the remuneration that that individual takes from the firm, the the um, the bow will put the spotlight on it. It won't prescribe what should happen, but it empowers the shareholders to make that decision. When the shareholders decline to um, approve a report, then that remuneration report is not capable of being implemented. So that is quite an important and um, and significant um, discipline that would apply uh, on, on earnings. Then does this incentivize employment outside South Africa? Well, of course, at the end of the day, <clears throat> when individuals make their decisions, there are, there are people who, who may get a better deal globally, um, but in many jurisdictions, uh, companies already provide a significant amount of information on earnings of top executives. So uh, we would hope that we've been able to craft this sufficiently carefully by not prescribing, by not putting a cap on the incomes, that we're able to obtain um, talented people who will work in South Africa, and at the same time that we address public concerns by ensuring that there's transparency, that shareholders know what the um, income gap is between uh, the executives and um, the employees. So the key has been to try to strike that careful balance. And it's not the only area in the bowl that we've had to think very carefully about striking that balance, uh, but it's one of the significant areas and uh, I would be I would be most um, uh, keen to get uh, feedback from Parliament as uh, the portfolio committee work through the bill 
on whether you believe that we've struck that right balance. There will be uh, potentially stakeholders that would want much more to be done. Uh, honorable members would have seen in public commentary, many stakeholders have asked for uh, uh, much more intrusive legislation. There are stakeholders that would want less to be done. Some of them may want nothing to be done on this matter. And uh, some of those views have also been put in the public domain. But the, 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 the role of the executive is in balancing all of that, is to put forward a package to parliament for parliament's consideration that we think properly and adequately addresses the concerns of citizens. This is vital in a democracy that law must um, respond to concerns of, um, of citizens. And at the same time, that it does so in a way that does not undermine our other objectives to grow the economy, to ensure that um, we attract um, top talent and that our businesses can thrive domestically and globally. Honorable Mulder um, uh, raises the uh, the question of the pay gap. I did take notice of <clears throat> a moment of high discrimination where Honorable McPherson was uh, um, uh, titled as comrade and uh, Honorable Mulder was not. Um, I did not see Honorable Mulder complaining, but in case he wants to, uh, I have opened up uh, the door, I hope. Um, but more seriously, on the matter of the pay gap between the top 5% uh, and the bottom 5%. So the challenge we face is that if companies are only evaluated by the pay gap between the top executive, typically the CEO, and the lowest paid worker in a company, it may not give a good reflection of the general pay gap in that company because you may have a company in a particularly complex moment of its um, history that has to get an extraordinary uh, CEO to navigate uh, its affairs, and that may come with a very high bill. So you could have what is called an outlier effect, that this is one CEO in a company where the top management is not paid a lot more than, um, than normal, or in fact, they may be on the normal curve, but one person is paid a lot more for very exceptional reasons. And so if you only take the top individual and the bottom individual, it may exaggerate the, um, the pay gap. Uh, and, and so taking the top 5% of the, the, the um, uh, income bands and the bottom 5% will help to give a more measured sense of whether a company in general is out of line um, in um, in uh, ensuring uh, a fair um, and, and a reasonable um, uh, a ratio, or whether it is um, uh, uh, within uh, within that range. Honourable uh, Tring, thank you very much, <clears throat> also for your comments. Um, and um, uh, we we have taken <clears throat> note of the the challenges that came up in the uh, FETF process. I. I am uh, pleased, though, that the bulk of those, um, or all of the concerns that were directly raised, <clears throat> have now been addressed in the amendments and the <clears throat> the, uh, the amendments that came through in 2022. And so many of those <clears throat> that had originally been proposed by the department are now part of our law. On the issue of <clears throat> incomes in the public and in the private sector, First, on the, um, the public sector, the observation, Honorable Tring, that you've made on municipalities also applies sometimes to, um, to national entities. And it's an ongoing um, uh, dialogue and sometimes quite a, a challenging one because sometimes in the public sector, the argument would be made by managers that um, uh, or boards, uh, for that matter, that in order to attract managers of the requisite expertise, they compete for those skills with the private sector. So when private sector uh, differentials are high, it imposes, they say, uh, a, an, an obligation on uh, a particular public entity to match that. We find that particularly 
um, in uh, entities that are significantly exposed to the private sector, your regulators and so on, your development finance institutions and others, where the talent mix <clears throat> is often exactly the talent that the private sector is also looking for. So we hope that um, this wider disclosure can also help. Um, and uh, and where where these, these levels are out of kilt, that uh, action can be taken. But it is striking just to, to see how many uh, instances there are where public entity salaries are above that of the president of the republic. And obviously running a country is quite a significant um, uh, responsibility. And uh, so I, 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 I take note and, and, and agree with your observation there, uh, Honorable Tring. On the private sector, the, uh, the issue of, of, of Steinhoff is, is instructive. And so is the issue of Tonga Tulet. I came, I was in KwaZulu Natal yesterday attending a meeting, among others, of the sugar industry uh, to discuss the, the state of the industry and the, um, uh, the uh, uh, measures that can be taken to, to strengthen the industry. And through the sugar master plan, we were able to make considerable progress in the sector until we were hit by the uh, the problem with Tonga Tulet. And Tonga Tulet um, is, is an important company in the sugar industry. It um, refines almost half of South Africa's sugar. And um, it, uh, it was forced uh, to, to go into business rescue last year, essentially because of fraud in its accounting system, fraud by members of the board um, uh, or executives of the company. Uh, that matter is now in court, so I'm not going to comment on the specific merits of it. But the effect of that was that a once proud and large South African company was almost brought to its knees. And it's still not completely out of the woods. Um, and, um, and it shows why corporate governance is so important uh, and why the, the, we've got to constantly look at the lessons from all of these and see what reforms it may require. On the delinquent directors, um, Honorable Tring again made a, a very good point there. As And it's, it was a point that I think was inherent also in Honorable McPherson's remarks that it's all about trying to strike that balance in, uh, uh, in, in dealing with this. That we can't not deal with it. Uh, we have to deal with it but we can deal with it smartly in a way that um, takes the public objectives forward. Honorable uh, Malamecha uh, brought an interesting additional dimension to it, which is how do we, if I can paraphrase what he said, what he was really saying as I understood it is, given the particular history of South Africa and the high levels of unemployment, what does that mean for the debate and discussion on uh, income inequality. Now, while the the matter of executive pay um, does not um, directly relate to what a company may do in terms of employment, it does often deal with, it often feeds unhappiness uh, on the shop floor. So often trade union leaders report that uh, they struggle to get uh, a mandate from their members for a settlement of a wage dispute, uh, even when they are able to point to the company's underlying financial performance, because employees would point to the outliers, the high salaries of one or two or, or a small number of executives in a company. And so part of our, uh, our, our generation's job has been uh, to take forward the building of a, of, of a united South Africa, one that brings together black and white South Africans uh, with different histories. And um, uh, that cohesion, that social cohesion is very important. It's a very significant uh, objective that we all hold dear and which the constitution provides a framework within which we seek to achieve greater and greater levels of social cohesion. And so uh, I, I would say that 
It does make it more stark in South Africa than would be the case in many other countries, particularly given not only the history, but also the, the current impact of that history that we, we remain a very, very unequal society on so many different metrics. And that means in South Africa, even if another country could ignore dealing with the issue of income inequality in South Africa, it is a, 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 an important issue for us to deal with. Honorable Malamecha then asks, does the Act set out how one determines the reasonable of the remuneration? And the, the answer is no, the, the Act does not give a set of factors that boards must consider in determining the reasonableness of remuneration. There were proposals like that that I have um, that I have heard. Um, but when we when we considered it carefully, and when it was debated in NEDLAC between the uh, the uh, business community and the trade unions, everybody was was in agreement ultimately that the significant reform that we're seeking to do with the the company's uh, law in this phase is greater levels of disclosure rather than the prescription of the criteria that should apply to the test of reasonableness. So we've left the issue of reasonableness to shareholders. For public companies, it can be compared. For private companies, it would be um, a matter, a large private company. The shareholders would have to, to make that judgment call, but they will have reference to what is happening in the market. There's a uh, a fairly active industry that tracks incomes in, in South Africa uh, with large consultancy companies uh, normally managing that. I come across that from time to time when we have to appoint senior executives in state-owned companies, then typically a board would bring to my attention a remuneration report that has been compiled that says for that particular expertise, that is, this is the market rate, and it's it's typically significantly higher than what we can or, or should be paying uh, in the state. So I think shareholders will have a lot of tools available to compare like for like, to say this company is in the mining sector, uh, it is in <clears throat> this particular kind of mining. Yeah, the job of the CEO is a lot more complex because it is one where it's not just a um, a, a a significant um, management of a, a going operation, but it may be a mine that went through a difficult period. Whatever the, the the circumstance of that company, they will be able to say, "We take note of that. We're the shareholders in this company." At the same time, we now look at what other similar companies are paying. And um, board board members, you've overpaid here. That is uh, that is really what we've uh, left it to. That the reasonableness will be on a case by case basis, conducted by the shareholders, uh, looking at the information that the act now requires be made available to the shareholders. The um, question then uh, that uh, uh, Honourable Malamecha follows up with is. Why are some companies excluded and what type of companies are excluded? In, in uh, our approach in the Companies Act, this is the existing act already, we make a distinction between what I can loosely call companies that are publicly significant or from a public interest point of view significant and companies that, while they are very important as economic agents, may have a lower level of public interest significance. And where a company has a greater level of public interest significance, uh, the requirements for disclosure and, um, uh, and, and even uh, conduct on such a company can be higher than ones that would apply to medium-sized businesses whose um, overall impact in the society or in the economy is less, um, uh, shall I say, uh, has a, a lower uh, public interest expectation. What are the criteria that would apply? It would be things like the level of employment in a company. If you have a company of um, 
a small smaller number of employees. There may be less societal consequence uh, uh, on that company through its wage policies or its remuneration policies than a, a very large uh, company that has you know more than 30, 40,000 employees. So that's one criteria. The other criteria is um, uh, something like the the turnover of the company, the economic output of the company. Uh, obviously, uh, it's self-evident the the importance of a factor like that, or the uh, the significance of the company as measured in other ways that the Act uh, and the regulations set out. So that's already covered, and we're not. At, in this um, set of amendments proposing a change to that. There's already a public interest score in the Act. This was done in the major reform that came from 2004 to 2008. And we're really just um, putting this proposal within that framework. If I turn then to Honorable Monakedi, uh, Honorable Monakedi, also pointed to the um, uh, some similar questions, but I'm going to pull out the ones that I've not yet addressed. And Honorable Monakedi's uh, question, it was a very interesting question around the consequence for failure to obtain approval of the remuneration report. Well, there's two things that flow from it. The one thing is when a remuneration report is rejected, the bill proposes that the members of the remuneration committee should not be eligible to stand uh, as or to, to, to be members of that committee for a set period. In the corporate world, if you have uh, a, um, a, a mark against your name that uh, you were excluded by operation of the law from serving on a remuneration committee for a set period, uh, it affects your um, uh, your reputation. So we believe that that is one important way in which remuneration committee members will ensure that they apply themselves diligently to their responsibility, which is to manage uh, the affairs of uh, the company as regards payment for the senior executives in a manner that is consistent with the economic need of the company and societal expectations as would be expressed by shareholders in a company. But also the remuneration report itself has to come back to a future meeting and uh, the board <clears throat> would have to engage with shareholders in between meetings uh, to ensure that those views are properly taken into account. Honorable Monakedi then asks, uh, the million dollar question uh, which is how will the, the bill ultimately address what will be the impact on income gaps and inequality and as I've indicated um, Honorable uh, Monakedi we've taken the view having considered it carefully that what could be helpful in the South African context is a a model that requires disclosure, that gives clear powers to the shareholders, that hold the board accountable, that requires both a remuneration um, uh, report and an implementation report so that there's a visibility and that all of these have to be, uh, that the, the remuneration report has to be brought to an annual general meeting for the shareholders to look at. Could we have gone further? The answer is uh, clearly yes. We could have gone further, but we, we do recognize that we need to be able to move with a degree of care in uh, what is put on the table, that when the business environment is uh, strong, robust, uh, forward-looking, then Parliament uh, may have uh, uh, one set of options to put on the table. When we're trying to build a greater level of business confidence and we're trying to, to strengthen investment uh, in, in the country, we've got to find a careful balance between that imperative, that requirement, and um, 
the the needs for uh, a for us to respond to the the concerns of citizens and society and we believe the balance that's been struck in the bill does that that while it may be uncomfortable for a, a particular executive who is paid a very high salary unrelated to performance unrelated to challenges with uh, acquiring scarce skills or high performing talent um if that person is um so embarrassed if that board is placed under pressure by shareholders that is as it should be on the other hand where a high performance individual in an absolutely critical skill does earn uh, more than than their peers and it can be defended in um, by the board then the board should so put out its case it's that attempt that we uh, we 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 uh, we we're seeking to do here and it it follows considerable discussion between key stakeholders with a business community through nedlac with a labor constituency in nedlac and um there will be some voices in business not all that would uh, typically uh, may may not have wanted any regulation on this there are some voices in labor typically not all that may have wanted an absolutely tight prescription and we try to find something that can uh, where we can build a broad consensus but still have it as meaningful in society uh, honorable chairperson then raises the question on state owned companies uh, are salaries set by national treasury or um, does each state owned entity set its own uh, remuneration typically for certain kinds of public entities national treasury would set the guidelines for board fees that board members get on in re- respect of ceos because there is such a vast difference between the skill level that's required say of an escom compared to say a um a small um a statutory body that may be responsible for accreditation of um entities like um sanas as an example uh, the skills levels of the ceo of um escom is not comparable to the skills levels required in sanas sanas also requires strong skills no question about it but the the risks of getting it wrong in escom as we as we have, as we have seen is so enormous on the economy on society on citizens that um the uh, the 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 level of um the kind of person you look for in your top leadership is different so so there's been a, a lot of discussion in the state whether we should have a one size fit all or whether we have in fact guidelines that could um, apply at the moment um cabinet wants to have visibility on the payment of people who are recommended um uh, for appointment uh, and so this uh, they are from time to time uh pushed back by members of the executive to boards uh, on these matters but as i say the challenge is the very skills you need to run a successful public <clears throat> in is often the skills that you you need to run successful private sector businesses and the state also needs to find people in that same pool which is exactly the challenge it's the challenge that um uh, honorable um mcpherson and um uh, honorable uh, molder had pointed to which is the skills pool and so there are no easy answers with these things um and so we've we've tried to find uh, an approach that takes all of this into account on consequence management i've i've covered that matter honorable chepers and as well as how to determine reasonableness so let me let me give back to the chair i hope i have covered all of the questions that came up uh, in um, uh, in the comments by members of uh, the portfolio committee thank you very much uh, minister um i my apologies for stepping out of the meeting earlier um i think you've covered all the questions uh we so far we will follow a long road to get to the end of um or to get to the ultimate goal of uh passing this amendment bill uh can i just uh 
take this opportunity to thank the minister uh, for the uh, very broad and uh, thorough background that he's given to us for this legislation, and also to the to the members of the portfolio committee for their valuable input. Uh, can I just ask the um, uh, committee secretary to just broadly sketch for us the way forward as as we consider the company's amendment goal? Um, thank you, Chairperson. Just with regard to the process going forward on these amendment bills that were ATC didn't table and referred to the committee, we are in the process of finalizing um, applications for publication of these two bills and adverts calling for public comments. Ones that will probably happen within this week. And once, and also we'll indicate on these adverts when the due date is, and the committee will probably most likely schedule public hearings in October, because we want to give sufficient time for the public to prepare comments on the bill. So 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 that we don't have any challenges going forward when when we have completed our process. So the intention is to 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 publish these two bills for, for public comment and hopefully. During October, we will schedule public hearings on these two bills as part of the legislative process and guided by the rules of Parliament in, 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 in that regard, Chair. That is just a broad outline for the process uh, um, as, as, as requested by you, Chair. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I'm sure the committee will also uh, get a document that um, lays out the, the roadmap uh, for for this legislation to pass through the committee. No, nope, definitely you, chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our business for today. Thank you very much, members, and apologies for the uh, connectivity problems experience. Thank you. Thank you, chair. <clears throat> thank you, chairperson. Thank you, chairperson. Thank you, chair. Bye, colleagues. Recording stopped.